It's funny, you're all awesome. Yeah. All right, let's take a quick look here. Let's kind of gradually get back up to speed. Stuff a little bit. Okay, so in case you forgot, it's been a while. We're doing tables, right? We're doing taking functions and we're trying to sketch graphs based on tables. And so the assignments that I just put up, there's two assignments for 3.6. One of them is a is a math Excel assignment that is very quick. So we're going to go through some, they're kind of more, the problems are, are uh, conceptual, right? So we'll look at some examples of those. And then maybe we'll, you know, it's a short day, I don't know, I'll, I'll pick an easier one and we'll go through, we'll go through one and use tables again today. And we'll do, I, I want to kind of want to take today and maybe tomorrow with that. And at that point, I might be willing to just turn you loose and finish up, finish up those assignments. And then I think we'll actually do, I think we'll do a little test. Like a, uh, you know, probably, I want it to be at least part paper and pencil so I can see you make tables. We'll do a little test over this. But this test is not intended to be, like, uber difficult. But it's, I want you to be able to pull all these concepts together. And, and you know, and make a table, right? I want to be. I want to see you be able to populate all the lines on a table, f prime, f double prime, and use the table to answer questions and, and come up with a sketch. Okay. So that's so we're just just so you get an idea about the time frame, and then after that we'll jump into optimization. Okay. But this really is pretty important for us to get into optimization to make sure we all get this stuff down. Okay. So, focus up here, please. So let's take a look at this problem. Tell me what you know about this. It says, use the graph of the function f, which I'm about to pull up here, to estimate where f prime and f double prime are zero, positive, and negative. So before I even throw the, the, the graph up here, pull it up so you can see it, what are the things you're going to be looking for? How are we going to know where the first derivative, f prime, is zero, positive, or negative? What are the characteristics going to be? How are we going to know? Where the first derivative is zero. Okay, but more not necessarily. That's that's those partial zero solution. Tan, horizontal tangent. Okay, horizontal tangent line. Right? You want to know where the first derivative equals zero is where the slope of the tangent is zero. So we should see horizontal tangent lines on the graph. Okay, uh, raise your hand here, somebody. How about where is the first derivative positive? How are we going to tell on the graph where it's positive? What's going on on the graph where the first derivative is positive? Say it again. Uh, first derivative is positive. Yes. First derivative is positive. Okay. So it would be what? Oh, so, so what's that? Okay, I mean, you just told me. But what's that mean in terms of like a, what's the vocabulary word we typically associate with that? The function is what where the first derivative is positive? Increase Right, increasing function. So an ant walking from left to right is walking uphill. First derivative is negative, obviously then it's decreasing, and it's walking downhill. Okay, let's look at concavities. Second derivative, right? I guess I kind of let the cat out of the bag a little bit. Right? Second derivative is associated with concavity. So where would the second derivative equal zero? What do we call that kind of a place? Now, the first derivative is zero. The what we're really looking for with the first derivative are maxima and minima, right, extrema. And so remember, that's where we want to, we're going to find all the places where the first derivative is either undefined or zero, because that's, those are the only places where we could have extrema. Now let's draw, let, let, let's kind of draw a parallel here to second derivative stuff, right? Second derivative, where the second derivative is zero, what could be happening there? What do you think? What do we call that point? Flexion. Okay. Good. Place where we're and, and and really we can kind of fill in a blank there with like what is the definition of an inflection point by looking at where is the second derivative positive and negative. Where the second derivative is positive, what's what does that tell you about the shape of the curve? It's concave up. Concave up. Okay. So what's concave up? Describe that. Okay, so smiley face, so it might be, but it doesn't have to be a minimum, right? A concave up just means that the function is catching water, right? So the best test for that is in a region where the graph is concave up, where is a tangent to the curve always going to sit relative to the curve? If it's bowl shaped up, 
tangent line is under, uh, under the curve, so it's sitting below the curve. Where the second derivative is negative and it's concave down, the tangent line is going to sit on top of the curve, right? So now let's pull up the graph and just find those places. So, you know, let's just assume really convenient values. And I'm, I put those directions because it, I mean, doesn't that kind of look like that's a little bit to the left of it? Right? That's but just uh, assume the most possible convenient values, integer values, for all of the x values that are crucial. That's uh, f of x, right? This is graph of f, just plain old function. Okay. So you tell me then where would where would the derivative be positive? On what interval? So negative. f prime is greater than 0 on what? Negative infinity to 1 or looks like supposed to be, I mean, trying to be 3, right? There you go. Okay. And so f prime would be less than 0 on what? 1 to 3. Okay, f prime equals zero at x equals one and x equals three. And that makes sense, right? Because we can see at those places we get horizontal tangents, right? So those are going to be the dividing lines. Those are the dividing lines between the regions of positive and negative first derivative. Okay, now let's move on to concavity. So on what interval is the second derivative positive? And once again, assume the most convenient possible values for x. What about 2? x is how is is where it's zero. Okay, so so we spotted, what do we call that place again? Inflection point. Good. So right here, it looks like that's going to be the transition from concave down to concave up. Down, concave up. Okay. So it's concave up to the right of two. That's going to be where the second derivative is greater than zero, right? So from two to infinity. Uh, Second derivative is less than zero then on negative infinity to two. And we already kind of said second derivative equals zero at x equals two. Right? Make sense? Okay? Good. Questions? Okay, coming back. All right. So let's look at these real quick. And I just these are statements. True or false statements, but I want more than just true or false. I want you to tell me why. This didn't work. You have to write anything down here. This will. This, you're going to know all this stuff, but I just want to dredge up some stuff that we talked about. Some of it fairly distant past. So that if we know that the zeros of f prime, right, are negative three, one, and four, true or false? The local extrema are located at these points. Now, I'll give you a hint. You'd be real tempted to say true, and I would know why you're saying it, and you'd be saying it for a good reason, but technically, sometimes. technically the best answer is sometimes, which is therefore false, right? How come? Not always. Not always, right? So these are, these are what we'd call critical numbers, right? These are the first derivative critical numbers, so those are potential extrema, right? Potentially those could be extrema, but they don't have to be, right? We have to test them all with our table to make sure. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. So we know that first where the first derivative is zero, those are potentially extreme. Right? Could be an inflection point or something like that too. Right? Could have a horizontal tangent without it being uh, a peak or a valley. Right? Okay. So that one we said was false for 
for technical reasons. Right. It's trying to be true, but it's not quite. So what about the next one? If the zeros of f double prime, so the zeros of the second derivative are negative 2 and 4, then there have to be inflection points at those places. What do you think? Is it possible to not always Exactly. It's, it's sometimes true, so it'd be, so this statement is implying it's always true, so we'd say false. And once again, how come? So, okay, so these are, these are places where we could have inflection points, but they don't necessarily have to be inflection points, right? We'd have to check them and see if they actually are places where the, the second derivative transitions from positive to negative, right? Because that's really, remember, that's what we said an inflection point is. The inflection point is a place where the second derivative makes a transition from positive to negative or vice versa. Just like a first derivative, just like a, uh, an extremum is a place where the first derivative transitions from positive to negative or vice versa, right? Okay, and we added the additional, and I don't want to dwell on this too much, remember we also said to avoid some other further difficulties, it's really a good idea to also define inflection points to be places where there is a horizontal tangent to it, because otherwise it gets a little weird. And it's different books will disagree on those definitions, but that's a pretty solid way to think about it. Um, but we don't have to go there today. So the zeros of the denominator of a function are negative 3 and 4. So the function has vertical asymptotes at those points. True or false? Remember, true means it's always true. How many counterexamples do you need to a statement like that to, to make it be false? One. Right? If there's one hole in its swing, then it's false. Right? That's implying that's always true. Can you think of a place where a function could have a denominator that's equal to zero and have it not be a vertical asymptote? What else could it be? It could be a hole, right? What are, let's go back and just think about that again. It's been a long time since we've talked about that. But if we've got a function where you have a shared zero in the top and the bottom, remember that's always going to be a hole. But if it's a unique zero to the denominator, so the bottom is zero but the top is not, then it's always a vertical asymptote. But it could be either one, right? So all these sound pretty good on the surface until you think about it a little more closely. And then finally, the last one here, how about this? Oh, it's the same one. I don't think I meant to do that. Well, never mind. It didn't change in the last few seconds. Math has stayed the same, so we'll just assume that one stays the same. Okay, what about this? Sketch a curve with these properties. Okay, I throw this one up here because this is like this is, you're going to get a question like this in math itself. You're likely to get questions like this next year in calculus too. Not everyone's going to use the, 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 the vertical, uh, kind of the table form that we use. And so you can always, just the point I want to make with this, you don't really have to do this, but we could easily build a table based on that information. Right? That makes sense. Okay, and then, then to me it makes more sense. If you build a table, you can see the relationship to the graph more easily. Okay, so let's let's do that. So we are going to make our table. So what are the important points here? Negative one, zero, eight, and ten. Don't those, you agree those seem to be the places where things are changing in one or the other of the derivatives, right? So those are the values we're going we're to put up along the top here. Okay, so what's going on at those places? It's telling us that when x is less than negative 1, so if I were to pick a test point to the left of this, I'm getting negative first derivatives and negative second derivatives. Okay? If we pick a point between negative 1 and 0, we're still getting negative first derivatives, but we're getting positive second derivatives. Okay. If we pick a point in between 0 and 8, so on this interval where x is greater than 0 and less than 8, 
The first derivative is positive. The second derivative is positive. Pick a value between 8 and 10. We're getting positive and negative. And if we pick a value greater than 10, we're getting positive and positive. Is that, did I do that right? Everybody double check me real quick. Yeah. Okay. So now this says, I want to point something out here. This says sketch a curve. It doesn't tell you, there, it puts no other constraints on that. So sketch a curve with those characteristics. So let's sketch an easy one, right? Let's sketch one that does have horizontal tangents. So could we fill in any other convenient values, being as we get to we get to make any kind of curve we want, what probably is going to go there? Zero, right? It's a transition from negative to positive, and so that's zero. Where else am I going to find zeros? Right there? Right? Agreed? Anybody see that? Uh, I've got a point of transition right here. Transitioning second derivative sign and then right here. You see that? Okay. So then by the second derivative test, what does this have to be? Here's what we got. We know that every place. Hang on a second. Oh, okay. We got to fill in one more little blank. One more little thing. So, at x equals zero, if the first derivative is transitioning from negative to positive, but the second derivative is not transitioning, then effectively, what is the second derivative there? Right. How could, well, what does the concavity have to be? If at every point to the left of zero, the concavity is positive, it's concave up. Every point to the right is concave up. What does that tell you about at zero? Could it possibly be concave down? No. It's got to it's got to be concave up, doesn't it? Right. Okay, so that acts like concave up. And so what is this thing? Well, this is a what? First zero, first derivative, positive second derivative. What is that? A horizontal tangent. It's a happy function because the second derivative is positive. Okay, can you make that association between both tests? Second derivative test. We know that because this the, the second derivative doesn't transition at zero, stays positive, right? So by the second derivative test, it's positive, or by the first derivative test. Because we're transitioning from negative to positive, so we're going from decreasing, right? Let me see that. Let me see what my hands doing. We're decreasing to increasing, and so that by the first derivative test also has to be a minimum, right? Okay. How about right here? What about this one? Well, the first derivative is not transitioning, right? Second derivative is. So what is this one? It's got to be an inflection point. Right? Okay, how about right here? Second derivative is transitioning, first derivative is not. Right? And so this is also an inflection point. And then right here, once again, first derivative is not doing anything, second derivative is transitioning, and so that's an inflection point. So we only get one extremum on the whole thing, which is right there. It's a minimum. If we wanted to graph this thing, then what might it look like? So here's the x-axis. Here's x equals, or yeah, x equals zero, so there's the y-axis. We can make any curve we want. What's it going to look like? Well, we know we've got a minimum there, right? We're going to have a point of inflection right here at 8. So somewhere along that line, we've got to have a point of inflection. We have to have another point of inflection right there, and we have to have one right there. But we can only have one extremum, which is a minimum. So we can draw that in. Right there's our something like that, right? Now what do I have?
that's got to happen here. It's got to be. It's got to go concave down, doesn't it? And, and it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a vertical tangent there, right? Sometimes, I mean, let me make it a little different. It doesn't have to be a vertical. Tangent. It could just be like this. It's just going from bowl shape down, or bowl shaped up to bowl shaped down. Same thing over here. It's going bowl shaped up, bowl shaped down, and then up here, it's going to shift back to bowl shaped up. Get the idea? And here's the one that's the choice you would have had in Math Excel. Same thing. Same idea. Okay. Is that the only one it could be? No. It could be. Could look significantly different than that, but it's to have that same basic shape. Okay? All right. Try this real quick, at least in your head, just try this. Sketch a continuous function on f, so I can draw without picking my pen off the board, on some interval that has the properties described. The function has one inflection point, but no local minima or maxima. Very slow on draw that. Click on that. Yeah. Make sense? We buy that. Right, so it's got one place where we're changing concavity down to up, but there's no stream bar. Okay, good. All right, last one. Okay, suppose a continuous function f is concave up for all values of x less than 0 and for all values of x greater than 0. Assume that f has a local maximum at x equals 0. Okay, so if it has to have a local maximum at x equals 0, and those are the concavities, then what has to be true? Okay, so, and, and I threw this one on here because we can have a big discussion on this if we wanted to. Right. But if zero is where this thing is transitioning from concave up, right, there's the concave up interval. And this is supposed to be concave up also, right? Uh, but the function, it's, it's not considered to be concave up at zero. Then what's the only way that could happen? It's going to be concave up everywhere over here and concave up everywhere over here, but it's not concave up at that spot. Well, if I just if I did this, if I just continued that along smoothly, isn't it concave up at zero? We agree, right? So then, why wouldn't this have just been negative infinity to infinity? But it's not. They exclude zero, right? So the only way that could happen would be, and here we have a. Uh, has a local maximum at zero. at zero. How are we going to get a maximum out of that? That's a minimum, right? It's going to have to look like a. W. The only way we could make this thing work is if we did something like this, right? If it's concave up and concave up, and now we get a maximum. Right? See how that works? And so, what's the correct answer? Yes. Right? It couldn't be this, could it? first derivative couldn't be zero there, because if it was zero there, that would have to be a minimum, wouldn't it? Kind of a tricky question, right? Could the second derivative, or the first derivative be infinite? Well, I mean, okay, but if it is, then it doesn't exist, right? More information is needed. It kind of seems at first when you first read it, you kind of think, wow, these, no, we can pin it down. First derivative just can't exist. 
That makes sense? That's kind of tricky. All right, how much time we got? Bring it up, but I don't think I can do anything else in five minutes. These problems take too long. So I want to go through an example. But I would just draw my table and we'll be done. <laughs> 